My career started many years ago, and I like to say I was birthed out of the Howard University experience. Coming from Texas, I knew very little about the world. And when I stepped foot in Washington, D.C., it was as if the world landed at my feet. Um, I met so many people from different parts of the world and, and just doing that and participating in different organizations and going to different events hosted by um, international organizations. I really learned that the world was my oyster and I also wanted to make a contribution to, to development, to foreign policy and to education. And so while I was doing it at Howard, I ended up meeting um, a now retired U.S. ambassador who told me about the Foreign Service. And I didn't know anything about the State Department, but what I did know, I wanted to take my interest in languages, my interest in, interest in culture, and my interest really in, in building and bridging communities uh, into a space where I can make a difference. And that's how I ended up in, in the Foreign Service. Um, it's, it's one of those things I like to say that, you know, as a young person, you never know where your path is going to take you. Just be passionate about something. Um, talk to as many people as you can. Um, and, and be vulnerable. Be, be willing to explore, uh, explore new ideas and new spaces. Um, and, and I say that because while I was at Howard, I developed this passion for the African diaspora. I am sixth generation American, but I can trace my ancestry to Africa from the, the early 1700s. Um, and so that has, that idea in itself has really thrust me into a space where I want to bring communities together around shared, shared cultural ties. And I've really focused my career having served in places like Cairo, Egypt, Sao Paulo, Brazil, Baghdad, Iraq, um, Niamey, Niger, and most recently um, Angola into that experience. Um, and so fast forward now, having worked um, specifically as what we call a public affairs officer, and that's one of the five areas of specializations in U.S. diplomacy, I uh, am now in a place where I am advising policymakers on how to make U.S. public diplomacy better and more effective. And I've been really lucky to be a part of what we call the U.S. Advisory Commission on Public Diplomacy, where I sit as the senior advisor. And it is, in fact, um, the oldest bipartisan foreign affairs advisory board in the U.S. government that was established uh, around the period of the Cold War to assess, appraise, and inform U.S. government public diplomacy activities. And so, you know, we produce annual reports that are mandated by Congress. Uh, we talk with the field practitioners, our American diplomats working in public diplomacy to see what their experiences are and what Washington needs to do better to support um, the effectiveness of their work to carry out U.S. foreign policy. And we make recommendations, but we also have um, another part of my job that I like, which is a focus on specialized topics. And when you ask me, you know, what was my career before? Well, I like to say that my career is now. Um, and, and it has been even as a professional and as a student. And that's why I decided to come to, to SAIS to really deepen my understanding of international relations, um, U.S. foreign policy, and figure out ways how I could bridge the practice of academia and, and, and the practice of diplomacy so we can better understand how issues and matters in the space of subnational diplomacy, which is now an emerging field of international relations, can improve the economic development prospects of um, emerging economies. I chose to come to SAIS for a variety of reasons. I think one of the things we talked about earlier is kind of my journey here. And as I mentioned, I started off at Howard University in Washington, D.C., um, where I studied communications, and then I went to Georgetown University, where I studied at the School of Foreign Service with a concentration on Latin American studies. Um, and after being in, in the Foreign Service for numerous years, I decided to go back to school. I think, you know, it's something that my grandmother would always say is that you're never too old to learn. Um, but I was also interested in the question of just refreshing my knowledge and, and what the scholarship was saying, um, what it has said, 
uh, and, the, and, and how scholars are, are thinking forward about some of the current day global issues we're having to deal with. And I think that's important, particularly in the field of diplomacy, um, because the issues evolve. Uh, the, the people uh, making decisions evolved, and the po political environment and context evolves. And so um, I'm here as a first year uh, Doctorate of International Relations student uh, looking at U.S. foreign policy and how it intersects with, with soft power. Uh, I'm specifically, uh, and I specifically chose SICE because it's a top tier university in international relations. It's in the heart of where all international relations things take place and where U.S. foreign policy happens and you have access to the leading thought leaders um, from government organizations, from different countries, and from institutions. And I really wanted to use SICE essentially as a springboard, a sounding board, and a resource to help me be a better foreign policy maker, um, both in the United States, but also where, also when I am in the field working with um, foreign counterparts trying to find solutions. So I do hope that with, with my study, my interest in U.S. foreign policy, Africa, and subnational di diplomacy, I could be uh, a leading thought leader in, in how to improve the, the prospects for American communities to, to become more closer to international affairs and the, and the global issues. Because we have been leaders, um, obviously, on, on the global stage. But how can the everyday person from the Midwest or from the South really understand that they too have equities in, in the decisions made around uh, clean energy, human rights, climate change, and agriculture. And I think that's the space coming from the South um, is where I could be a voice in, and offer some form of representation. The, the beauty about being a diplomat is you get to reinvent yourself every two to three years. So I see kind of like this sabbatical, if you will, this academic um, sabbatical of studying and as part of my rejuvenation process to prepare me for what's next. Um, ideally, I'll continue with my work um, in diplomacy, but I'm really interested in figuring out ways and how to support institutions of higher learning um, and in particularly historically black college and universities to have a more strategic footprint um, in, on, on the global stage. Um, and historically, HBCUs, as they are called, have. But in, in looking at issues of urban development, uh, climate change, democracy, some of these really hard-hitting hit, hitting issues that we at, we at SICE are talking about, how can we bring in partners and, and figure out solutions, whether it's at the private sector level, the nonprofit level, and our, the government level? And so I haven't really figured out a... Uh, you know, I don't have a plan on a whiteboard or any special special notebook, uh, but I, what I do know is that I do want to work with chambers of commerce, institutions of higher learning, um, and nonprofit organizations so that they can be more engaged in an active way um, abroad and, and in Africa, but also help African uh, governments at the national level and local level um, to build the capacity to engage better with uh, American institutions of, of higher learning. And I think that's one of the challenges that we find. Everybody's interested in partnerships, but the question is, do we have a common understanding of what a partnership looks like, what success is, and how we can bring in other stakeholders so that both American students and students from other countries can mutually benefit from, from exchanges, but also help our, our local communities. Um, and so at some point, you know, if, if I'm not in my afterlife as a diplomat, maybe I'll be in a leadership role at a, at a university. Um, I think that that would be a great place to land in administration. Or perhaps I'll be working um, in the private sector at some, some big firm where I can make sure that they are being socially responsible and thinking about sustain, uh, leaving sustainable legacies that, that lift up communities. Yeah, I, I'm a student of life. <laughs> and I think, you know, I, I, I've always been this person that 
follows the yellow brick road. And, and, and so Sites is part of that, that journey. It's part of the yellow brick road. And, and where it takes me, I do not know, but I have enjoyed being in an environment where I have an opportunity to meet wonderful colleagues like yourself, who challenge my intellectual thinking or enlighten me on, on issues that I haven't been privy to. And then I take those ideas, and I will be taking those ideas back to my my day-to-day -day job, um, but also putting them on paper. And so I am taking the liberty to write more, and I'm, I'm very proud to have published an article um, at the Atlantic Council, which, which speaks to this idea of, of building bridges and, and convening and, and cultural connectiveness. Um, one, the, the article called Pan-Africanism, um, how uh, Pan-Africanism really ushered in uh, an era of change for African continents to be engaged on a global scale. Um, and I think that's a, that's a practice that any continent or community can use, which really is about allyship, which is about finding common ground and coming together to to, to move things forward in a way that make change inclusive. And so um, I think, you know, SICE is, SICE is just one of those places where you can, you can develop your thinking at the highest level and then walk out of, a, out of this place a totally different person. And, and I feel like I'm on that trajectory to, to be a totally different person when I finish this Doctorate of International Affairs but also be a, a leading voice um, for, for particularly individuals who may not have access to these platforms um, and whose issues are equally important. Well, I feel like there's an epiphany each day <laughs> when, when I come to, to, to size the ideas are, are flowing. I think one thing that um, has come to mind in, in having exchanges, particularly with, with you, is this idea of really the role of sub subnational diplomacy. And I really think it's the future of um, international relations. Uh, you know, unfortunately, I think we live in a, a, a polarized world. Uh, it's becoming and it's growing more polarized. We, we see that in the United States and we see that in other countries. We see the decline of d democracy. We see the rise of author authoritarian governments. Um, and so, you know, what we are hearing is that at the subnational level, that means, you know, at the, the state level and at the um, municipal level where our mayors sit, um, they are increasingly playing a, a, a more present, visible role in the conduct of foreign affairs. And I think the more we can shape, inform, and guide that discussion, um, in the political space, but even at the citizen level, I think the more effective um, and responsible we can be in, in solving some of these global issues at a local level. And, and that's the space where, you know, coming from a small Texas town to the big city of Washington, D.C., where I knew nothing about big institutions like the State Department or the World Bank, or even universities like John Hopkins, um, it's an opportunity for me to give back and it's an opportunity to make the work that um, I do at the State Department, the issues that I learn at Johns Hopkins, more accessible um, to, to our American communities. One of the things that I am really proud of and also excited by um, is that the idea of convening people to facilitate change. And so one example I like to, to share is uh, the work I did in Angola when I kind of encouraged this idea of the Angolan government as well as institutions of higher learning to think about the United States as a partner in higher education. Uh, and so because of a lot, a lot of the engagement that we, we have with them, both in Angola and the United States, um, Angola is now on the verge of signing uh, an agreement that will hopefully be supported by one a global institution. And I, I bring that up because this is a country that had a long civil war, that has suspicious ideas about the U.S. government, um, but through public diplomacy and using public diplomacy tools such as the International Visitor Leadership Program, whereby um, foreign, uh, foreign counterparts come to the United States for a three-week program, 
and meet their counterparts, they were able to get a sense of what is possible. And I tried, I tried to, to highlight that, as I mentioned earlier in the, the article I wrote for the Atlantic Council, is again, Pan-Africanism, how Africa can secure its next diplomatic win. And that again focuses on African countries coming together and figuring out what are some best practices, perhaps maybe from the US, maybe from Europe, that they can take to develop their institutions, and in this case, institutions of higher learning. So I'm very pleased to know that you know my work contributed to what will, will now be historic legacy, and hopefully in the future we'll see more American universities engaging with, with, with Angola. And, and I think that's the beauty of, of the work we do at the State Department, but at the same time, in building upon that, being in an academic environment, I'm able to think about how issues around political culture, institutions, and civil society, standards, um, et cetera, can really shape and form the infrastructure needed for these type of uh, programs, if you will, to be long lasting um, and, and have the impact we want to see. So it's not just, here's a program, make it happen. It's what's the environment and the context and how academia can support the work that us practitioners do in the field. And so uh, it, being in school is fun, but each day it gives me new ideas on how to work smarter. Yeah, I, as I mentioned, I do consider myself a student of life, and I I put I take great pride also in being a mother. I think oftentimes, you know, when we look at professional women and our students who are pursuing a degree later on in life, we oftentimes don't think about working mothers who may position themselves for continuing their education and growing. And so I do, as part of my identity, I use that as inspiration um, to other women who are starting their careers, who are advancing their education as a, as a reminder that it can be done and that the work that we do is an example for women in other countries who may not feel it's possible. Um, and, and so my message to, to any young woman who's starting off, any young student at SAIS, to know that it is possible with hard work, with focus and dedication, and that your story becomes part of your life, your life's work.